meeting time for summer hours for the 10 a.m. Uh, we are recording this call. We'll send it out to you. Welcome, everybody. Um, I hope you've been having a great summer. <laughs> if you've been having a summer, which any of you probably are in the same, uh, have not. Um, so I first am going to start off talking about the Pathways program. And this is a opportunity for anyone you know in your SAU um, who would like to do a fast paced intensive one year um, program to become certified in a 282B. For those of you who have 282 teachers certified, we add, and they're interested in getting the 282B, um, this would be an opportunity for them to be offered free programming to be able to get that additional certification. What happens in the pathways is the Deb Brooks Ellis who facilitates that does a transcript analysis for every member of staff um, that you have and they will fine tune uh, the programming to make sure that the requirements are met to receive the 282B. As someone who's in a teaching role, that year of teaching would be considered the teacher internship that you know is required. Um, and additionally, we have you know had two years of learning about this program through CDS staff. This is open now to anyone in the state. So even if you know like an ed tech who wants to get a certification, anyone who, a gym teacher, a general ed teacher, anyone who wants to and have interest in getting this as a free opportunity. It's, it's not even a reimbursed opportunity. You just get the courses as you sign up for them. And it's really individualized and fine tuned to um, whatever people need or want. So, um, and one of the great things that's happening as an adjustment to this, we are adjusting the course load because we've gotten feedback that as you're, you know, this is designed for you to be able to do a full work experience and do this at the same time. But with all of um, what's happening in everybody's life kind of shifted from four courses per semester to three to make it a little bit more manageable. We're also incorporating PBIS and Pyramid. Pyramid is the preschool version of PBIS. And that's gonna be incorporated into this learning opportunity. We are creating a newsroom piece. It's going out, we're trying to fine tune, um, you know, um, how are, how, like, you know, are you going to be able to get a bachelor's degree for 282B or are you going to be able to, so that might be an opportunity too. So we're just fine tuning that based on the language and the law, but certainly anyone who has a college degree in anything can um, apply to this. If you have certified staff who are now going to be conditionally certified as a 282B, this is a great opportunity for them to just take whatever additional is in place for free, not out of pocket, there's a cohort of people that um, there's going to be up to 20 participants this year and then another 20 probably next year. So um, I've set, I put the link in the Google Docs um, that just kind of gets you on their list. And what happens is Deb Brooks Ellis will reach out and, and do some individual work with your teachers to make sure that they do, a, like I said, a, a, an analysis of coursework they've already had and then what needs to happen moving forward. Um, I have started receiving lists of folks that you need conditional certification for. So you have a 282 who now is going to be needing a conditional 282B. I'm still trying to create a workaround for that for this cohort. So if you could please send me a list of the people who you need conditionally certified as a 282B in, in order to proceed with cohort one. Um, there was a session for CDS staff uh, yesterday, Heather, and so I'm thinking uh, that is recorded, but likely I think we're doing another one on July 30th. We're doing another informational session on July 30th. So filling out that Google Doc will provide um, any educator in your world who needs to do this. So we were going to prioritize um, individuals in co the SAUs in cohort one 
for this opportunity. Um, if we have, you know, if there's 50 people in the state that really want to take advantage of this, we're prioritizing these, this cohort to make sure that you guys have the certified staff you need. No, oh, and it, yeah, I'm working on a workaround for that too, Beth. The, um, typically the um, conditional certification costs $100. And then when you go to professional certification, you have to pay for additional $100. So I'm working on um, seeing if there's a workaround for that. Mm -hmm. So just right now, I just want the lists of people who you need conditionally certified. And we're going to try to um, figure out a way, a mechanism to um, make sure that's of no cost to the folks in your area. Uh, conditional certification would be very easy to obtain for somebody who already has a 282B. If they don't have the three SPED classes at graduate level, it'd be very challenging to have that conditional certification. Um, Aaron, I think you were saying that um, the two, if they have the 282, you said if they had, it would be very difficult. It, it would be very easy if they have the 282. Um, but you said that they had the 282B. The, the question was, how easy oh, is it to I get? Did I speak? Yes. If you have a 282, there's no problem, right? You already have a professional certificate. So they already have the graduate requirements for conditional certification. Um, it's a 282B that you would be conditionally certified for. You'd be issued a conditional certification during this year. Um, and we're looking into how we can make that happen for all of the teachers impacted in this cohort. So again, I'm collecting a list of folks. Um, I've gotten some of them who need that professional certification. Um, and I'm also telling you that if there's anyone in your, any interest you have for an ed tech three who has a college degree, this is a great opportunity for everyone. I mean, it's not often you get an opportunity where you don't have to pay anything up front to get this kind of an op experience. So it's very, um, it's a very great opportunity for anyone who kind of wants to do some additional learning. All right. So um, the next item on the agenda is some fiscal determinations that um, were made that we have members of the fiscal team that aren't here, but Barb was, Barb has been meeting with the fiscal team, so she's going to share with us those understandings that have been developed through the work that we're doing internally. Good morning, everyone. Erin, I don't have the agenda. So um, um, if you wanna pop it into the chat, I'll make sure I cover all of whatever's on the agenda. Did you mean the document that you generated? Do you want me to share that document? No, 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 that it would the just agenda be just says fiscal update. Oh, fiscal update. Okay. Well, there really isn't too much of a fiscal update. Ida and Paula are working on getting you your, your first quarter allocations. Of course, that money is not available until August 8th, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but it's somewhere right around August 8th. So that will be forthcoming. We've been working on um, high cost audit district mechanism for you, which we will have refined and ready to roll out to you before the end of the first quarter so that we can go through that process with you. High cost in district and, and any other anomalies that have happened. Um, of course, you're collecting your enrollment information. We're looking at a mechanism to help pay for child find. So that is new and upcoming. So watch for that in, in the coming weeks here. Um, we want you to continue to build main care if you build main care um, as usual. And then if you could just get a hold of us and let us know that you're billing for main care, there is one little step that we need to take to identify those costs as preschool. And we can help you work through that um, one-time process. Um, I put in the chat, Barb, the um, determinations that you made with Paul at that meeting, which is what we were expecting you to um, share today. And I don't think that I was very clear when I asked you to share. So I'm just going to ask you to look at your um, document in, um, I think that you've shared the main care situation, but um, 
I just um, wanted to give you that as a reference point. Uh, I do want to, there is a question. Yes, at one point you were asked not to build main care. That, that is true. But at this point, we would like you to continue to build main care if you build main care. Um, and then, like I said, if you could get a hold of us, there is one step that we need to take to identify any main care revenue as preschool. It's a small one-time process that we can help you um, work through. I and just want to interrupt and say, um, if you are billing main care currently for five to 20, we're going to be meeting with you individually to talk to you about main care. It's not a requirement of cohort one to bill main care for preschool. Um, but we will be, if you are billing main care, we're going to be, like I said, an, in an individual meeting going through what that would look like and what that would entail. I just want to clarify that. Yes. Yeah. And so I um, have a mysterious document that I'm looking at that I don't currently have in front of me, Erin, if you would send that to me. I feel it's like in I Teams. Do you see it in Teams? Uh, okay, thank you. Well, now I can get on script and tell you the information you really want to know. Um, yes, if we will reach out to you, Marianne, to schedule. We're going to talk about how the meeting structures are going to change, but um, we are going to continue to do individual meetings with you. Um, moving forward as part of the work that we do. Perfect. And yeah. And then um, if you are starting to build main care, then we'll also have a conversation with you individually, not on this call, about what that would entail for you to, if you are interested, build three to five year olds. Catherine. Okay. okay. So let me get back on script, Erin. <laughs> you have this so well laid out and I totally flew off script. Here we go. Uh, we are exploring using the Grants for Maine system as uh, a tool for, for um, monitoring and quarterly, monitoring your quarterly disbursements. So as a tool to make sure that what you have been given is sufficient to cover your costs, that we're, we'll use it to determine high cost out of district, high cost in district. Um, we'll be looking at compliance. Uh, we'd like to do 100% compliance in the first quarter simply because we need to collect data on what those costs look like uh, so that we can move forward in a thoughtful way on the funding formula for the cohort two and subsequent years for you all. So we're going to try, we're going to ask you to be a little data heavy for us in the beginning part of this process in order for us to set a system that will be um, functional and sufficient for you in the future. So I'm gonna lean on you all a little bit for that in the very beginning um, parts here. Um, we're not sure we're using grants for Maine at this point. We're, we're exploring that. We're talking with them um, to make sure that it is an easy tool for you all to, to use in order to provide all of that information and for sort of a data management system into the future so that we can look back at that and, and utilize that information. Um, what would happen in, in at DOE at this point is Ida and Paula will do your quarterly disbursements out of this funding formula. And then my team, Colleen and I, and the special services team would do the follow-up compliance and then those true ups uh, to make sure that everything is paid for because this is 100% funding through DOE. Any questions on that? district high costs that you already aware of, I would love to be aware of that. So you could send that to Paula and myself and Aaron just to put it on our radar. Um, child find, any initial child find data you might have would be very helpful for us as we look to explore uh, a potential funding mechanism for child find. Um, Starting to build main care this fiscal year. Yes. 
We talked about main care, so you can skip over that bullet. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm reading the chat right at the moment. We want to make sure that Jen Hopkins, if you reach out to Jen Hopkins um, and let her know that you're billing main care, then we will we will contact you and, and have that conversation, um, schedule it so that we can get that rolling. Um, like I said, disbursements are coming in August. That's simply because the funding is not available to us until then. Um, we'll let you know as soon as we know whether grants for me, the grants for made system is going to be the system we're using, and we certainly will set up training for what, what you would be doing in that system and how that system would function in relation to how you get your, your increase in quarterly payments. Um, so staffing wise this first year. It will be just the DOE folks that you're fully aware of. Ida and Paula on questions for um, the funding formula disbursement, quarterly disbursements. And then Colleen and I at Special Services, Colleen O'Neill, and myself at Special Services for subsequent activity on the monitoring side, which would include your out of district um, allocation, your high cost in district adjustments, um, and things like that. And that's what we've come up with so far. Uh, we are working again on a child find mechanism for you, funding mechanism. Um, and we now have a potential system for us to use in order to do the monitoring side with the high cost and out of district, high cost in district adjustments. Am I forgetting anything? No, that's perfect. I think what I will reiterate for folks is that. Um, well, I will, I will let you know that we are coming up, we are finalizing an informational graphic that talks about the different types of activities that can be funded out of which fund, which I think will be really important. We know that Lori Whittemore has been around to all of you now and that there's a massive ordering happening um, in regard to classroom materials and furniture. Those things are being processed now um, and the other informational graphic that we are going to give you is kind of the process of how a child gets referred and when would be that cutoff for when they can be eligible for a potential child find funding option, which we are developing currently. Um, and again, this is all new information. So just remember that there's going to be potentially the need for adjustment as we move along this, like maybe a cost that you didn't intend that um, is occurring on behalf of a student in your catchment area with special education and that we are, um, are you know, are, we will be 100% funding that. So I know that there are concerns, you know, with potentially not having these things completely fixed right now, but I think, um, that again, we're gonna be sharing more and more information with you as we're developing it. Um, and the other, the last thing that we'll talk about, because um, unless you guys have any questions, which we can get to as well, is the structure of this meeting moving forward. So what's become really apparent to us in our meetings with you individually is that the individual meetings are more fine-tuned to your specific um, questions and concerns as an SAU. So we are gonna shift to more individual meetings. And then these meetings, these large group meetings, which be just kind of a level setting, a dissemination of information. Also, if we have any resources and tools to provide you any global updates that are gonna pertain to everyone, such as the Pathways Program, that's what these meetings are going to be about. We might also be providing some professional development in these meetings around childhood outcomes and things of that nature as we're moving through this work. Um, the information, you don't, you aren't um, subject to state assessments such as happening in third and, and eighth and 11th grade. Um, more than that, but you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but there are um, assessment indicators that are federally required for this age group. And it's gonna be important that you understand 
how to understand the terminology around that, understand how you're collecting that information. And um, those, this meeting will be used for those kind of larger global conversations that we need. The next meeting we're going to be um, discussing our, ed, our consultant, Susie Perry, is developing a new website portal for you to have access to different buckets of information, easy access to documents and resources. So that's what we'll be reviewing next time. So I think um, what we have found is that those individual conversations are just a little bit more fine tuned to what your specific needs are. And so we can address those directly that might not pertain to other SAUs. Is there anything I missed? Anyone on our team? Okay. Right. No problem. We've moved really quick, quickly. Um, and I know we've just sort of done a little bit of a very fast download. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's totally fine if anybody wants to say, can you repeat that whole first part? Um, I know that we say that sometimes as a joke, but we did move pretty quickly, uh, particularly through some of the, the funding source information or some of the funding decision-making. We will be following up with um, uh, some of the information sort of summarized that Barb just, just walked through so that you don't have to go back and listen to the meeting again. Um, and um, we'll also include those points of contact that Barb outlined for us. Um, so Kate's question about the next meeting, Erin. The next meeting, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I um, think it will be the 31st, the 31st at 10 a.m. Um, next week, we will not have a meeting. Um, the other um, big, the last big idea I'm gonna share in this group um, is one that we've been discussing internally because Child Development Services, CDS, has been identified as the agency that's dealing with special education in this age group. One of the terms that we haven't used in our state ever is um, the term early childhood special education. And that is what we're talking about. Acronym is ECSE, but I'm not going to be using that for many, many, many years because I'm going to be saying it out loud, early childhood special education. We're actually rebranding the CDS site to have that title, early childhood special education, because that is section 619 of the IDEA, early childhood special education. So I just want people to be like, understand that that term is a cultural shift for me, but it does really globally identify the, the services that we're talking about. And CDS is going to now be a subset under the umbrella of early childhood special education. In our state, CDS has been the sole provider of early childhood special education. And now that is shifting through this uh, rule and through the work that we're doing here. So I'm saying, I'm announcing that, um, terminology we're going to it's going to be a big part of the rebrand of the cds website it's going to convert to an early childhood special education under the umbrella of part b which is what it is it's under part b 3 to 22 so instead of having this very segregated system of support for special education for this age group it is part of the bigger part b system so i just wanted to say that um, and we're going to be using that term a lot in place of um, CDS. So mm. you would like a fiscal meeting. OK, yes, we can definitely, definitely have a fiscal meeting um, with coding questions. Yeah, our fiscal team, much of our fiscal team is out right now today. But um, we can prepare something for you for the next meeting around any questions. If you would like, what would be very helpful for us is for you to submit questions in advance that we could then um, kind of directly provide like an FAQ to the group and then kind of fine tune some of the questions that are um, around those. That would be really helpful for us because again, we're doing a lot right now to kind of build the structure of how we're gonna pay you. 
So I know that you might have some more detailed questions, but um, because our focus is kind of a global payment at this point, it would be helpful if you could give us your specific questions. So please send those questions to Jen Hopkins and she will compile them for us and we will get um, something to you around that. You can give us the questions by the end of this week. And if they come in after that, we'll take them. Yes. You don't have a middle initial, do you, Jen? I do. I'm posting it right now, too. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, why aren't you coming up? It's middle initial. It always gets us here at the DOE. Yeah. It does. So Jen's going to post it. Any other questions before we leave? There you go. Jennifer L. I thought it was an L, but I didn't want to say it out loud until it got in the box. Jennifer.l.hopkins at main.gov. Any, and any particular questions you have beyond fiscal, any questions you have, we can, um, I'm sure that if you have them, other people will have them or they'll hear the question and say, and think to themselves, I didn't realize I had that question, but I have that question too. So it's really helpful. Any of your questions that you provide to us help guide our understanding of the information that we are creating for you. Because again, there's a lot of moving parts right now. And um, some of the bigger structural work that we're doing might not get to the fine tuned questions, but we know that we are meeting with you. We've met with several of you already, Jen and Sandy have. We are going to probably have a couple other people joining those meetings in the future, including Susie Perry, who is the um, former 619 coordinator for Arizona and has a lot of experience and background in um, different types of program offerings. A question just, Megan has, yeah. does anyone not use Google? I know everyone in the DOE has a hard time using Google, but we do use it. Um, so we have some prohibitions on the use of Google, but um, what I am realizing when we're dealing with such complex matters here is um, if there was a way to even be able to have the visual of our agenda as well as running notes as we are speaking to you so that people are able to process that and even record some of the questions. I know it's always challenging when questions come up in the chat um, to have those in a place where somebody can come back to them, particularly if there are answers or other links or other resources that are loaded into the chat. So I'm right now just sort of processing like what's the, the best and most efficient way to um, have that those kind of running notes that everybody on the screen would be able to not just see during the course of a meeting, but be able to access after. So speak now or just, uh, you know, raise your hand or scream into the ether if you are not in uh, a Google environment in your uh, school district. And um, we will pursue whether or not we can put some, uh, some of our notes in a Google Doc going forward. You can also private message us. No one wants to scream into the ether? No one wants to scream into the ether. <laughs> All right, everybody, we're gonna end our meeting a half hour early. Um, we're gonna, as Megan says, work on um, kind of getting some visual note taking um, during these meetings so that you can um, see and potentially add questions or comments live time um, if you're that kind of processor. And additionally, I will remind the team that our next meeting is on the 31st at 10 a.m. Stay cool, have a great week.
and um, we'll see you next time. <laughs>